and the discussions on that five days was televised live in more than a dozen TV channels throughout Somalia. So the Somali people were watching and listening what this scholar was. And at the end of the five days, they produced a fatwa statement saying that the actions and the behavior of al-Shabaab are un-Islamic. They have nothing to do with Islam. So the people of Somalia should not be mistaken by some of the nice uh, words or the nice speeches that they are saying. So that has a big blow on the thinking and the mindset of the society. Number two, we established a TV channel 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that advances that ideological war against Al-Shabaab. We've organized a distribution of leaflets in the rural area by helicopters so that the people will be given contact numbers so that they can contact directly through the phone. And so many people, they have a very a good connection of the mobile phones. So this was one front, and it was very, very effective front. It keeps back from the community to support Al-Shabaab and the communities. That's what makes the popular uprising against Al-Shabaab in the rural area, remote areas. Now, we open it also a third front, which is to fight Al-Shabaab against their economic sources. We deny they have been collecting a huge amount of money from the Somali people. And this money, nobody today takes money with their hand back and moves around. They use bank, they use the remittance companies, they use the mobile telephone, mobile money systems. So the government went into these systems and we started to block a couple of hundred accounts in the bank, in the remittance, and in the mobile money. So their movement of money has been restricted, not completely closed or tabbed, but restricted. So because of that, their capacity has become restricted now. They don't, have the facil they don't have the financial capacity they had a year ago today. Still, they are moving money here and there, but not as they were a year ago. They cannot use the banks, they can use the remittance, they cannot use the electronic or digital money in Somalia today. So these three strategies put together, Somalia, uh, the Al-Shabaab's capacity has degraded to a level. They are still threat, but not as threat as they were a year ago. We started the war 30 kilometers outside Mogadishu, the capital city of Somalia. And today our forces are 800, 900 kilometers away from Mogadishu. So more than 50% of the country is liberated. There are four federal member states in Somalia whereby Al-Shabaab was occupied on the rural area, not the towns. The towns were always free, but the rural area, and they restricted the movement, the supply lines and all this. Today, two of these four states are completely free from Al-Shabaab, and the other two is the operations are already started and going on. Uh, we are past it the day that we were planning to finish the war. But we are very much confident that we will finish Al-Shabaab, defeat Al-Shabaab militarily. Ideologically, they may stay some time within this community, but militarily, definitely, we will defeat them soon. Thank you, Mr. President. Speaking about fighting terrorism, we are watching the Houthi in, uh, in Yemen. Uh, we know that they are supported by Iran. Uh, we know that they say that they want to fight Israel, but in reality, they are threatening the world maritime trade uh, in, in the Red Sea. How do you see at them? How do you consider them uh, in the frame of the, <clears throat> of the greater game for the Red Sea that you just described? They are a threat, and that's true. Uh, you know, when the neighbors are not stable. Your house is not stable as well. When the neighbors on both sides of the Red Sea are, are not stable, are controlled by uh, fragile states, 
the Red Sea will not be safe enough. Uh, in, in a couple of years back, uh, the piracy from Somalia was threatening the movement of uh, the, the, the sea lanes of the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. It costed a huge amount of money for the world to stop this menace or threat of Al-Shabaab, uh, sorry, uh, the piracy in the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. Today, the Houthis are now threatening again. And tomorrow, who will be the threat again, we don't know. There is only one and one solution. Those countries who are on the both sides of the Red Sea must be uh, stable countries. How to realize or how to achieve that objective is a different case which is very complex. And it is a long term. There is no one-time solution or one-shot solution. Solve Somalia, the Red Sea is safe. It's not true. Even now, if you said solve Yemen and the Red Sea is safe, that's not true. We need a comprehensive approach of that region, of the whole of Africa and the Red Sea. Comprehensive solution. So those countries that has an influence in the region, the Arabia, the Arab countries, the Horn of African countries, the Western world, the Eastern world, all of us, if there is a possibility that we can get together and have a region. But even then, all countries of the world, they are not, they don't have equal influence on the Red Sea. There are certain countries who got more influence than the others. So those who are inf got the influence on this region must get together and stop. Now, when there was a piracy in Somalia, there was a coalition of against the piracy, a global coalition against piracy. But when the question of let us help or let us solve Somalia, when that we come, there is no global coalition for helping Somalia to solve its problems. Piracy has been defeated. Okay, everyone went back to, to, to where it came from. And now we are seeing that again piracy is emerging. The piracy, they do not emerge within the sea. They come from the land. They come from the land. So unless you solve the problem in the land, you are not safe from a piracy. Same is the Houthis. There is a country called Yemen, collapsed, not stable. We don't know who controls who. Uh, some countries have tried to solve militarily. Uh, it was not possible. Some of the actors of the region has been may be excluded, others has been empowered. So, you know, different proxy wars here and there, proxy influences here and there, is only creating more problems. So what I suggest is that we need a global comprehensive solution participated by all influential actors. I will not say everybody, but the influential actors. Those, if excluded, can influence and the Houthis are a very, very serious problem today. The cause, the reason they are claiming that they are fighting for, maybe is, for some countries, is a reasonable cause. But the way, the violence, violence only breeds another violence. It will never, it will never solve a problem. What we need is a diplomatic solution, political solution. Then maybe other solutions of what I was talking about, the, the, the economic aspect, the poverty and all this. But the, the powers of the world, the Western power, particularly the, 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 NAT, the NATO and the European Union, the United States, United Kingdom, and of course we cannot exclude China and others also. We need to have a serious dialogue and solve. When it comes to the West and China, you solve your problems. You, you, the Western, they do not fight with China, and China does not fight with, with the West. China has economic interest in the West. The West has economic interest. There is a mutual interest between the West and China, for example. Why can't we have a mutual interest when it comes to uh, the area, the Red Sea or the why can't we see it as uh, the interest of everybody? Today, for example, we have some uh, commercial uh, uh, goods 
in Europe or some parts of Europe, for example, uh, a ship that leaves Italy, reaches Somalia, passes many other places, but reaches Somalia by latest in 45 days, 40 days, 30 days, even if straight less, three weeks. Today, if this ship is going to go all the way and come from the Cape of Good Hope of South Africa and then come to the Horn of Africa, how many months it takes? And all, every single day of the journey of that ship is money. It's a cost. So countries like Somalia today is suffering to get, uh, there is a, a lot of goods that are stuck in Turkey, a lot of goods that are stuck here in Italy. A container that was taking reaching to Somalia, $3,000 or $2,000 today, is costing more than $10,000 to reach Somalia and then a couple of months. This is the reality. Similarly, is a, that affects is not only Somalia, it's affecting Italy as well. If the Italian products are not going out and reaching the global markets easily, then. So I think, my dear, the, the solution lies diplomatic and political, not military. Alliance has been established. There's a lot of navies in the Red, in the Red Sea, but still, it's not secure. So what we need is a political solution and diplomatic solution for such uh, international uh, challenging issues. So finally, Mr. President, if I understand well, you suggest the possibility of a great deal between the West and China on the stability of the Red Sea. Is that right? Not only, not only China and the West, the regional countries. In the regional countries. Yes, the regional countries as well, yeah. If you want to give us a final statement, this is the occasion. Well, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much again, and uh, I'm very much grateful for Mateor for giving me this opportunity to be here today with you uh, and uh, share with you uh, the situation of Somalia. Uh, number one, uh, there is no any one country in the world that knows Somalia more than Italy. For example, during the civil war, we lost everything. The most important thing we lost is the data. We lost our archives. We lost all the records that we had. Fortunately, many of those records are available here in Italy. And the government of Italy has provided us back uh, some of these uh, 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 records, digitalized and we are already referring and using, yes, old data, but old data is the foundation for the new, the new data. So that's, that's a one little example. Somalia used to have, in 1990, before the Civil War, one university, called it the Somali National University. That university was established by Italy. And that university the, the, the language of instruction of that university was Italian language with 13 faculties, different faculties. And all the graduates, the good boys and the girls who graduate those faculties in that university, they used to come here and made a master's degree, PhD, and research and all this here in Italy. We missed all those opportunities now. Italy was also supporting many vocational and technical education in Somalia, where the technicians were produced in Somalia. Today, we have no one single technical institute in Somalia, privately owned, NGO run, but we don't have a government institution, and that where the government institution, Scuola Tecnica Industriale, which I graduated from my uh, secondary school was there, and many others. What we need is the Italian support. Of course, I said security as the top priority, but security is a temporary issue, I believe. Somalia will soon reach to a level where it can manage its own security. It's a matter of time, short term. But what's long term is the human capital. Italy can support us in developing a human capital, knowledgeable people who can uh, take with base of the advancement of the science and technology of today. We have a lot of universities, 
But those universities, many of them, they lack. We revive it, the Somali National University, it is there. And uh, we are working with the Italian government to support that university. We are also working with the Italian uh, government to establish a new Italian university in Somalia. But what we need more is not only, you know, university graduates, you need a number. But maybe 10 times or sometimes even 100 times of that number, you need technicians, those who can do the technical aspect, not the design and the uh, visibility studies and the estimation, but putting this blood on the, on the floor and painting and walking the electricity and maintaining the cars and all these types of is what matters a lot. And that's what creates a gainful employment for masses of the country. So this is in an area where uh, I think that not only the Italian government, but also other Italian agencies. We are very much grateful for this organization who is already providing uh, scholarships for a good number of Somali young people. There is nothing small for Somalia, and there is nothing big for Somalia. We are in between. So I would like to pass that message to the people of Italy. We've shared that with the government of Italy. I met His Excellency the President last night, and I'm going to meet uh, Her Excellency the Prime Minister this evening, and I am sharing these and many other uh, important issues with them. But in general, what I want is that it's the Italian people. We want to go back. People-to-people -people relationship is there with Italy. There are a huge property owned by the Italian, not the Italian government only, but the Italian citizens, plantations. The, of course, there were industries. The industries are not there anymore. They've been destroyed during the civil war, but the property are there. The plantations, the land is still there. So there is a huge uh, housing properties and a lot are there. The Italian government has also a huge property in Somalia and the, the, the Italian government has started rehabilitating those uh, properties. Centro Cultura Italiano, the Casa d'Italia, and, and many, many others are there. We don't have a lot of Italians who, the Italians, they used to have a school there where their kids go, but we don't have. But we are dreaming that we will have that uh, level of friendship will come back. So that's my, the bottom line of my message, and I thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Gracias.